As a stewardship uh, the messages this year have been a little bit off step with the way they have typically been in the past for a couple of different reasons. But well, one of the things that I do like about what it's allowed us to do is it's allowed us to focus on stewardship as opposed to kind of compartmentalized pieces uh, in a way that reminds us that our whole life is a stewardship. It's something that we are giving care over. And it doesn't matter what aspect of our lives we're thinking about or talking about. It's all intended to be used to further the kingdom of God, to spread the gospel of Christ in any way that we can, um, no matter who we are, what we do, or to whom we're speaking. And so today we're going to look at another aspect of stewardship, because if we understand that stewardship is of caring for everything in God's creation, then we have to realize that uh, this week particularly, we all are charged with a very significant piece of what it means to be good stewards over our society over our nation. Um, of course, we're talking about election day. Now, um, this election process has been pretty contentious to say the least in a lot of different ways. And today, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is something that unites us, that binds us and, and, and pulls us all together. Because a lot of what we see happening uh, and, you know, we see when, when debate and discussion give way to insult and aggression across the board. It reminds us that we have some work to do. There's going to be some healing that's going to have to take place, uh, starting now, really, but certainly following the election here on Tuesday. And we also have to recognize that if we look across our country, Christianity is not exempt from having participated in some of, of this uh, rhetoric, some of this behavior. So we've got a call. We've got a common call to ourselves as individuals and also together, communally, to do the work that comes with healing many of the breaches that have happened over the past year. Um, to that end, we're going we're gonna to talk about some scripture. Certainly the scriptures that Ruth read are where we're going to focus a little bit later. Um, we're going to take a look at some scripture that helps us understand that where we're at right now is not new. Uh, in fact, it's as old as time, it's as old as humanity. But before we do, uh, I just want to frame this up. Um, you know, over the past couple of days, as many of the rest of you have been, you know, I've been seeing what's going on on social media and that sort of thing. And so, I think it's appropriate, I want to share with you a couple of things that I've posted over the past couple of days. Two days ago, um, I posted this. People are scared. Remember this. Trump supporters are scared of Hillary. Hillary supporters are scared of Trump. And fear makes us do and say some wild things. Be kind and caring for those on the opposing side. They may not be stupid, crazy, or not. They may be afraid. Love each other no matter what happens, and trust that love overcomes fear. Trust that overcoming fear overcomes division, and trust that unity brings out the best of who we are and who we can be. Yesterday I posted this. Make it to worship tomorrow. This week we elect our next president. As we undertake this great privilege, the only faithful way to engage it is to center and humble ourselves before God. In your house of worship, there will be liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, and together we approach the throne of God seeking wisdom, courage, and peace. We worship in unity, and as we head into the election, we need as much unity as we can get. One candidate will win, another will not. With all the emotion involved, let's be inspired and humbled together to lose with dignity or win with grace. Knowing that God is ultimately the one we turn to for our guidance, and it is together that we'll make the best of whatever lies ahead. That makes sense. Did you need to hear that today? I needed to say it today. Because I needed to hear it today. So I want to jump into some scripture, and my hope is that we'll, we'll resonate with it in a way that is familiar with the first piece that 
we will take some hope at the opportunity that we have in the second. And really just what I want to do, and you can find this in the book of 1 Kings and kind of read through it if you have time today, or for the next few days. <laughs> but I'm going to summarize this uh, in terms of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, uh, at first, when you look in the book of Judges, they didn't have a king. And the idea was that they would simply let God be their leader, and they would follow God, and then things would go well if they followed God's commands. They didn't do too well with that, and so they said, give us a king. We want a king. Everybody else has a king. Give us one, too. And God said, that's a bad idea. Because the second you start following somebody else, you're going to follow them, which means you're probably going to turn away from me and subject yourselves to a lot of really nasty things that a king can do and impose on you. Did they listen to God's advice? No. They said, give us a king anyway. Here you go. Here's a guy named Saul. And Saul turned out to be fairly arrogant, fairly stubborn, and a bit unstable. And so the next one in line became King David. King David, known as the man after God's own heart, one of the great heroes of Scripture. And what David did for Israel is, despite the fact that his rule was not devoid of speed bumps and hiccups, he kept a focus on God, and he laid the foundation for Israel to become a strong nation. And that foundation was passed on to his son, quick Bible quiz. Anybody remember whose son took the throne after David? Oh, come on, I know somebody knows it. I know at least Don knows it. <laughs> Solomon. Now what was Solomon known for? Wisdom. What else? Wisdom. What else? Poetry. Poetry? Who's known for wealth? Structure. Because Solomon was the one that built the temple. And he undertook a lot of other big projects to build up the infrastructure of Israel. So, Solomon the wise, Solomon the wealthy, Solomon the builder. What happened at the end of his life? He ended his life, he turned away from God to idolatry. And so God looks down and says, okay, Solomon, you done messed up. Now, I told your dad, David, that I was always going to have one of his descendants on the throne. But I didn't say how big that throne was going to be. And so what's going to happen now is your descendants are now going to be on the throne of the kingdom of Judah, one tribe, and the other ten are going to go over here. And that became the kingdom of Israel. So the people divided, one under Solomon's line, the other into the kingdom of Israel. And this began the demise of Israel as a full nation. Because not only did they have to worry about the foreign powers around them coming in against them, they were also bickering and fighting amongst themselves. And when that happens, the nation becomes weak. Israel becomes a vassal state of some of the bigger empires back in the day, and eventually Israel becomes a victim of exile. They're carted off to a foreign land. The kingdom of Israel, in other words, not Judah, at one point becomes splintered. I mean, I mean, how many of you have ever heard of the lost tribes of Israel? Or the diaspora? Well, what that's referring to is this point in Israel's history when boom, they explode, and they're scattered. And that's why you have pockets around the region of where uh, the, the, the Jewish tradition took hold. Because they scattered and they never came back. So, they had some serious problems. And I want to point out that the problems was not just because God looked down and said, some of you people go over here, everybody else go over here. Because it's not like God just kind of whammy the entire nation of Israel and said, okay, you go over here and now you know what to do, and you guys go over here and now you know what to do. Because there's something about Solomon's plan, the way he governed, that we don't like to talk about a whole lot. See, Solomon's wealth wasn't just dropped out of the sky by God, and all these projects weren't just made because God sent angels to do all the heavy lifting. Solomon's wealth came because he heavily, heavily taxed the people of Israel, many of them in the poverty. And these major building projects came because he had no issue with forced labor. And so by the time this division 
had to take place. Those other ten tribes, they were kind of fine with getting out from under that ruling family. There's a sense of, you know, wait, we, we got a back door, fine, let's take it. And it was because as much of the division and the, the uh, I guess the politics of the day as anything. And that leads to Israel's demise. Now not only is there that piece of demise, but there's also the spiritual demise of Israel. Because what happened is a lot of the kings, if you read through the book of First and Second Kings, if you read through Chronicles, and they kind of outline and name all the kings in the line of these two kingdoms, more often than not, when it describes them, it says, and such and such was king and reigned for such and such years and did evil in the sight of the Lord. So these kings, more often than not, turned their back on God. Now let me ask you something. When the king turned his back on God, do you think the people went along with him or did they say, no, we're going to stick tight, uh, stick tight with the Lord? They went along with them. They said, okay, and off they went. And so in other words, what happened to the people of Israel in terms of their relationship with God as they prioritized their political affiliation to the king over their spiritual affiliation with God. And if we read through the prophets, we see the fruits of that over and over again. You're interested in self over others. You're more than happy to oppress the weak. You're not caring for the people who are sick. You're not, you're not loving each other. And Isaiah says, you know, what do you think I prefer? Do you think I would rather you go to the temple and make all of your sacrifices? Or do you think I'd rather you treat each other decently? The answer, of course, is treat each other decently. And so the nation of Israel, through this division of both spirit and politics, became completely lost. And that division didn't just last for a short time, because this is in the Old Testament we're talking about. But how many of you remember the Samaritans in the New Testament? See, that division lasted even into the New Testament, because it was the Jews who were in versus the Jews who were out. Is any of this resonating with anybody right now? We can learn from Israel's history. We don't have to do that. We don't have to be part of that kind of a legacy. Because we are called to something better. We are called to something more. And these scriptures in Colossians and Romans are fantastic in helping us understand what that looks like. I'm going to grab it. Were you hearing the kinds of things Paul was saying in Colossians and Romans about how to treat each other? Every single piece of it was about love each other. If you got a difference with somebody, fine, you have a difference with them, but love them. If they're hurt, care for them. If they're hungry, feed them. They're naked, clothe them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't think of, don't think of ourselves higher than one another, but look at one another as equals, as family. As brothers and sisters, maybe not by blood, but certainly in faith, as children of the living God. Do justice. Be gracious to each other. Have mercy. Be forgiving. That's what we're called to do. That is how we heal wounds, is by embracing and engaging that no matter what. Here's one of the things that I absolutely love. And this is verse 17 and 18. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And this part is great. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. <clears throat> How many people does it take to fight? Two. And so with this technology, you say, I'm not saying that everybody else is going to want to be peaceful, but I'm saying that you know what is good and you know what is right. My spirit lives inside of you. And let that out. 
No matter who is around you, no matter what they're saying, no matter what they're trying to push on you or take from you, as much as it depends on your actions, you make sure that you are doing everything you can to live in peace with those around you. That's a good word. I like that. Because it reminds us that contention doesn't have to be the way it is. It reminds us that we can overcome anything as long as we're willing to get into it together. As we're willing to love each other through it. <coughs> One of the big issues we have, and we're getting into where the sermon title comes from, is in the past year, as the world pushed us to think more about being a Christian or more about being a Republican or a Democrat. <coughs> We have been pushed, bounced, kicked in every direction <coughs> to think in terms of either Republican red or Democrat blue. <coughs> Stop thinking about red and blue. Think purple. Think about these verses because these verses are telling us about what we need to do to come together rather than be apart. When red and blue come together and make purple, what we're doing is we're saying, I love you anyway. What we're doing is humbling ourselves and saying, I realize that something of value rests in your opinion, and I want to understand what that is. And if you will understand what that is from my perspective, then we can figure out this thing together. It reminds us that compassion is what we're supposed to exhibit no matter what. I promise you, well, all right, let me ask. Let's, let's do a quick poll. This is a scientific polling process. It will be published in the Wall Street Journal. Um, how many of you believe that on Wednesday there are going to be terrified people in this country? Without question. Does, does it matter who wins? There's going to be terrified people in this country. Depending on who wins, it's going to depend on which people are terrified. That's all it is. But let me tell you something. The thing is this, all right? I know people who are loving, amazing human beings that are going to vote for Trump, and I know those who are going to vote for Hillary. And I can tell you that the way we respond to either our candidate winning or losing, whether or not is in keeping with this Christ-centered attitude, has everything to do with how we're going to move forward together as a country. <coughs> because if... If my candidate wins, I have a choice. I can either be like, you know, nina, 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 kind of a thing, and just sort of rub a people's nose in it, though I'm not publicly declared that that's going to be yet. <laughs> Nor will I. But my point is that we have a choice, if our candidate wins, to be continue to be uh, insulting and assaulting towards other people and say, wow, it's so good that so-and-so didn't get elected because da 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 and anybody that voted for them was da 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 But that's not going to help get rid of their fear. See, what, the, what fear needs is it needs somebody to say, it is going to be okay. And I'm going to love you no matter what. And no matter where we're headed, if we do it together, and if we do it with grace, and we do it with a sense of listening for the call of God over the call of humanity, we're going to move the right direction. And if my candidate loses, I have the option of throwing a temper tantrum. We have people predicting they'll throw temper tantrums in many different ways. But that's not going to help because I promise you, whatever candidate wins, their supporters are going to be afraid of retaliation. So if my candidate loses, if your candidate loses, we have the opportunity to do that with dignity. And say, yeah, it happened. And I love you anyway. What can we do together? How do we continue to move forward? How can I convince you that I'm still on your side? That we can still do all we can together to make the best of this situation. That's what we need. Because purple isn't just the color of red and blue come together. Purple is the color of loyalty. 
Purple is the color of the divine. What color do these cloths turn every Advent season as we get ready to celebrate the coming of Christ? Purple. What color do these cloths turn whenever we celebrate the resurrection and the reminder of the power and the glory in Jesus Christ? Purple. So when I'm saying think purple, I'm not just saying get along with each other. I'm saying when we think purple, we're thinking Christ. We're thinking God. We're saying it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what my party says. It doesn't matter what the leader says. What matters is what God says. What matters is what Christ calls us to do and who Christ calls us to be. And that means beyond any decision, any single decision or any single issue, it means that Christ calls us above all to treat each other how? With love. With grace. With kindness and compassion, because if we can get a hold of that, we can overcome anything together. That's not a question. I'm saying that's an explanation. And that's who I want us to be. Because as it says here, as much as it depends on you. So if we refuse to fight with each other, if we refuse to participate in the crazy that's going to happen, that's a whole lot of people that are contributing to the negative and are taking a stand for the Christ-centered positive. It's a whole lot of people that are rippling out grace and compassion and unity amongst the world. And that's human. That's us. That's the people of God. That's the people of Christ. That is the stuff of heroes. And that's what you're called to be. Now, I am sure in at least one person, there's a, 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 just a shred of doubt that that can happen. But, but I'm going to show you something here that's going to prove you wrong. We do something every year, and we're going to purpose this a little differently today. But every year, like I said, during stewardship, we're reminded of all the great things that happen in our congregation. You'll see this again next week under a different context. But, well, we'll just go ahead. nowadays I try to do this it screws up. <laughs> This is what we call losing dramatic effect.
this is urgent. tells us where there's prophecies they will fail. But what happens with love? It never ends. It never fails. So I want to invite you today as we come before God in Holy Communion. Remember that communion is an experience that we have but it is also a communal experience that we have. And so I want to invite you today, as we come forward, I want you to lay whatever frustrations or bitterness you may have that has been festering over the last year, I want you to lay that at the cross before God. And as we take in these elements of, of, of bread and of juice, that these are, these are elements that convey grace to us and let us come before God asking for the strength and the encouragement and the grace that as we lay all that other stuff at God's feet, we walk away with a spirit of hope and a spirit of unity that we pass into the world. And so take heart. Because we remember when Christ sat with his disciples and taking the bread, he broke it and gave thanks and said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup. Give him thanks. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Even the, even the forgiveness of very loud children. <laughs> Eat, drink, and as often as you do this, remember me. That you is you as an individual. And it is the you that encompasses all of humanity and all of creation. Remember Christ and take him with you. Praise God. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you assure us 
that there is always hope when we put our trust in you. We thank you that peace and that love and compassion and joy are our responsibility to spread as we live into the call of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would strengthen us, Lord, that in those times when we have such frustration and even anger, that, you would, that your spirit would calm us and remind us of compassion and kindness and gentleness. Remind us to place our hope not in any of the, the mechanics and the, and the institutions of humanity, but place our hope in you. Lord, as we move into the coming week, give us a spirit of unity and cooperation. Give us a spirit of love that overcomes every barrier in every instance. And Lord, as we live into our call and into the image of Christ, let that image spread throughout our community. And as it spreads throughout our community, throughout our nation, in a way that binds us together. That sets our focus where it should be on you, on the royalty of the heavens, on the divine that calls us into fellowship with one another. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.